Hey, it's Gerald from Lakers Fast Break. Anchor is the easiest way to make your next podcast. It's absolutely free, and their creation tools will allow you to record and edit your show right from your phone or your home computer. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on great podcast outlets like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, and many more. You can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So download the free Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to get started on your next podcast. back with another episode of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. It's Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here from Pop Culture Cosmos, Lakers Fast Break, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and Game Source. Appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our great shows. And if you get a chance, please give us that five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and you're able to go ahead and review. Also, like, subscribe to our show so you get the latest content. And boy, have we produced a lot of content specifically for the Lakers Fast Break just some great conversations that I've had with this man right here as my guest coming up, but also as well as Stone Hansen from DraftSite.com, Michael Weisenberg. He's coming up again from the step in. And then all these great draft experts, whether it's James and Raphael Barlow from the NBA Draft Junkies, Michael or Stone, I had a great not only first round but second round mock draft, which you will be able to hear this week, the second round. The first round's already up and available on the Lakers Fast Break podcast. And, of course, my great weekly conversations with Laker Tom from Lakerholics.net, which I went off on the Lakers. So you got to hear me. I'm loving the Lakers, bleed purple and gold. But you know what? When you take $4.6 million, eh, 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 and if you get a chance, you'll hear that on the latest episode with Laker Tom. But it is a good man indeed coming up once again we, as we continue our countdown of the top 10 centers headed for the NBA draft and the center position, as we've talked about and alluded to on other episodes, whether it's the mock drafts that we've been doing or whether it's the interviews with this individual, we've talked about the difference of the position and especially the center position has transformed and been something so much different than what it was before earlier this century. And it's now something even even different for these centers to actually still find a place on an NBA floor. So looking at 10 of the top centers for this draft in a draft that we don't think is going to emphasize centers a whole lot is something you you really have to do a lot of investigation. And there's no one that better that does that investigation than this next guest I have. He is part of, in fact, he runs NBA Draft Junkies. Dot com. You also got to check out his awesome YouTube page and subscribe there for all the latest videos on all the draft choices that are out there. It's Raphael Barlow and Raphael. Great to have you back on again, t- you know, doing another countdown, but the top 10 centers is a little bit harder than most. Yeah, it was, it was a little tough because it was actually anywhere between maybe 14 or 15 guys that can get drafted. So for, for me to make this list of the top 10, there's five guys that I didn't have on my list that could go anywhere from early in the second round to mid second round. It's, it's just going to be interesting to see how it all unfolds because I mean, a lot of people consider that the center position is obsolete, but there's still quite a bit of guys that, that should hear their name called. And there's some guys that won't. But it's still a position in the NBA that has some value in the right given situation. I, I know we there's some centers out there in the league now that find a spot and find a, a way to make a co- good contribution. I mean, we still see Rudy Gobert, who for the most part does a great job, especially anchoring that Utah Jazz defense, although you and I both said in the past that you can take centers like that and run him off the floor if you have the right offense matched up against him. But there are other centers that are out there, Jewel Embiid and others, that if you find yourself in a way that you are, you can find yourself indispensable, 
if you can find that way to adapt to today's MBA? Right, and that's going to be the the question for a lot of these guys that are um, that are eligible for this draft. There's a few centers that, production wise in college, they were very good, but the question is, can they defend in the NBA, or can they score enough to to be on the floor? It's it's going to be tough to, um, you know, just to predict where where every team has different guys. That I mean, there's a guy that we'll, we'll mention him later as a bookie from Kansas. Very efficient score around the rim, but can he defend in space? I mean, he's he had a very good college career, but I don't know if he's actually an NBA player. Well, we'll see how this breaks down uh, as far as what we see and what's going on with the pandemic that's going on and when this draft plays out and wherever it does, uh, you know, because obviously it looks like it's going to be something that's vastly different than what the NBA had planned before. And with this NBA season still up in the air, a lot of things to think about there. But the NBA draft at some point in time has to be executed. And this center position, again, is something that outside of one top pick is going to be very much, I guess, a buyer's choice or something that a buyer sees. One buyer, one one team may see differently on a player at that uh, second best, third best, fourth best center that may be vastly different from what another team sees. So that to me is kind of interesting in and of itself, because after that top pick that I think you're going to go ahead and count down at the end of this podcast, we're going to see a lot of different variations between numbers two through 10. Well, I, I think those two are, are pretty obvious. They, I think there's double lottery, but three through 10 could end up not even going in the first round. And then we can only have two centers drafted in round one. And then we can have a bunch in round two or, Maybe five in round two is so hard to predict at this point. So without further ado, let's break into it right now. Your choice at number 10 for the top 10 centers currently enrolled and making themselves eligible for the NBA draft. And again, this is subject to change, whether or not people go back to school, go back to Europe, what have you, injuries, things of that nature. So as of now, who do you have as the top, uh, as the number 10 center? headed for the NBA draft? Number 10, I have Nick Richards out of Kentucky. He's a guy who I thought if he had a, a more productive freshman year, I thought he was going to come out as a, a freshman. It's kind of shocking to see a player at Kentucky stick around as long as he has, but he's a junior. He, he has the I mean, he has the size. He, he blocks shots. I just think that he lacks a motor, and then he's also – 22, I think. Okay, maybe he'll be 23 once the season starts. So, I mean, you know how the NBA feels about guys that are 22, 23 in the draft. So, I have him as my 10th best center, but he's also a guy that I could see him getting drafted, and I wouldn't be shocked if he doesn't get drafted. But it could be a player that's still at, be at, at the end of the bench as a rotational player at some point in time in his mm-hmm. development. Yep. So who do you have at number nine? Number nine as far as the best centers headed for the NBA draft. Number nine, I have Reggie Perry out of Mississippi State. I mean, I've seen some boards lift him as a list him as a power forward, but in my mind there's no question he's a center. He's probably 250, 260 pounds. He's a pretty decent athlete. He has shown some flashes of being able to knock down jump shots and spread the floor, but I think his natural position is around the rim. With that in mind, why do you think his draft stock has dropped so low, or do you think it was just there in the first place? I mean, to me, I think it's been pretty consistent. It's just nowadays in the NBA, it's what position can you defend? And so is he – does he move well enough to be able to stretch, um, you know, defend in space? And I think that's one of the reasons why he's he's dropped to where he's where he's slated to go. But like I said earlier, he could go mid thirties or he can go undrafted. It's just so unpredictable right now. But he had a very productive season at Mississippi State. He rebounds the ball well, and he's he's a guy that if this were two thousand two or two thousand three, I think he'd be. A mid first round pick at the latest. 
That's what you you know you were saying when it came to the mock draft. Uh, some of those similar and echoing those comments. Uh, and again, he's one of those centers that, like you said, in another era, earlier this century, could have been something really special and had a really made a name for himself. And now, because we're living in a different era, it's going to cost a player like that tens of millions of dollars. I agree. I bet he'll be saying, man, why couldn't I have been born earlier? Born 15 years ago. <laughs> All there's, right. there's quite a few guys that... that are going to wish the same thing, especially who I have at number six. No, there you I'm go. Sorry, so, number seven. so we're I'm at sorry, number eight. eight. So, so we're at number, uh, so that was number nine, correct? So now we're at yeah. number eight for the top centers in the NBA, or headed to the NBA draft. So who do you have at number eight for top centers in the NBA draft? Number eight, I have Udoka Azubuki. He, um, I mean, he's been around long enough. It seemed like he played with Wiggins and Embiid. Um, very productive career at Kansas. He's, you know, very efficient around the rim. If I'm not mistaken, he's probably one of the all-time leaders in NCAA history as far as field goal percentage. He shoots around 70% every year, but he can't make free throws. I mean, I think he's like, I don't know, 30% free throw shooter. So he's a guy that oh, it's actually 44% this year. Um, he doesn't offer much as far as spacing the floor. I don't think that he can defend in space, but he's good at what he does as far as, like, blocking shots around the rim, doesn't miss, he rebounds. Um, but, again, he, he's another guy that if this was a different era, he's a first-round pick, guaranteed. And like you said, we're going to be seeing a lot of these centers have been devalued in this draft, and this is something we've been seeing as a trend. So... Yeah, right now he is at number eight. So who do you have at number seven for the NBA centers headed towards the NBA draft? For me, number seven would probably surprise people. Isaiah Stewart, he was considered a lottery pick going into this year. Um, I even think one draft slot, I won't mention their name, had him as like the number two pick going into the season. He had a, a decent freshman year. It wasn't what a lot of people expected out of him, but – He's just a physical bruiser. I'm not really buying his long-term potential as a floor spacer or as a guy that can defend in space. So I have him number seven. I, I, honest, to be honest with you, um, I wouldn't be shocked if, if his range goes from late first round to mid-second. I mean, I think he's, he's all over the place. He's an acquired taste, so it just depends on – who likes him or not, but for me, he's number seven. So that would be middle of the second round, close to the end of the second round for you. Is that correct? In normal drafts, maybe, but at this draft, that could be a very late second round, to be honest with you. And why has he dropped so far? I mean, you stated as to a little bit as to why, but, I mean, is there any more reasons why you think that there's a case? I mean, just because the fact, like you said, there was one draft site that we won't mention here, and it wasn't draftsite.com. I'm just not saying anything like that, but, uh, you know, draft site, draft site. Uh, I wanted to ask why, because like you said, there was a draft website that had him as not, that had him as high as a number two pick. And that leads me to believe that there's something that's gone horribly wrong if it's not been due to injury. I mean, if he blew out a knee... Or if he blew an Achilles tendon, okay, I get that. But this is something that's due to on-court production. Where did it all go wrong? Well, to be honest with you, I don't think it went wrong. He averaged 17 a game and about nine rebounds, two blocks. I just think it's a matter of opinion. Um, there's some boards that still have him as first round. I think Tankathon has him as a top 20 pick. But for me, I just have him as number seven on my list. And that's going to be something very interesting because you could still see an NBA team thinking in the past that, uh, you know, of his you know caliber and where he was at a year ago and say, you know what, that's where we still have him today. And could you see the scenario where he gets picked that high? He gets picked really high, well above what your realistic expectations for him are. Yeah, and no, it just depends on where they see his potential. Potential as a shooter. I mean, he's a he's definitely an energy guy. 
He plays hard. But the season that I think people expected him to have is the season that um, Okongu had. I mean, nobody had Okongu over Isaiah Stewart early in the season. And so, um, but even you can say the same thing about his teammate, uh, Jaden McDaniels. I think both of those guys were considered lottery picks coming into the year, and they just didn't have the freshman season that that they're expected to have. But Jaden McDaniels hasn't fallen as far. It's That's a kind of disappointing fall. I mean, he's read the press clippings, and I think if – he were to go back in time, maybe he should have gotten a petition or signed a petition maybe to get himself out uh, before the one year done. And uh, that could have been something that he would have looked forward to instead of going here, because it looks like the one and done has not worked in his favor. Well, what's interesting is that he had a more productive and better year than Jaden McDaniels. I just think it all boils down to NBA fit and long-term potential. He, he reminds me a lot of Elton Brand as far as how he plays. But, you know, I think if Elton Brand came out in this draft, I don't think he goes as high as he did when he came out. He was the number one pick, I believe. So I don't yep. think that he would be the number one pick in this draft if he can, if he had the same exact year. It's just a matter of how the NBA has changed. It is a matter of how the NBA has changed, and a player like Isaiah Stewart may never find or reach his true potential as an NBA player because of it. We're signaling the ref for a quick timeout, but we'll be back with more of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. Check out what's been going on with the Pop Culture Cosmo Show and the PCC Multiverse. I see the potential for basically like another Netflix kind of paradigm shift where here comes this other major player. They have a ton of resources. Apple could change the way that entertainment is consumed. They say it's the only time this year that you'll have stars from each brand battling each other. And we know it's not going to be the case, but they like to say that and more power to them, I guess. Well, it's a big first step bringing all those superheroes together. There were definitely some parts of the movie that I that I really enjoyed. And then there were some parts that I thought just kind of fell short of expectation. Part of it has to be something to do with how it's being promoted. And this is a thing where audiences do not agree with critics. That's the Pop Culture Cosmo Show. And the PCC Multiverse, every week on Apple Podcasts. And over a dozen of your favorite streaming and podcasting options. So who do you have at number six? Are we at number six on the draft list? Isaiah Stewart's number seven. So number six, who do you have for the top ten centers headed towards the NBA draft? For number six, I have – let me – we check my list. Yeah, I have oh Daniel Daniel. I'm sorry, Daniel Otoru from Minnesota. He's a guy that I actually like. Um, very good rebounder, active, um, plays hard. Um, he had a. I think he just kind of shot up a lot of different radars. I didn't have him as a as a projected uh, or projected draft pick coming into the season, but he averaged 20 points, 11 rebounds, two blocks. Again. Ten years ago, those numbers are guaranteed first round pick. He he may have a little bit more shooting potential than um, Isaiah Stewart, which is why I have him ahead of, ahead of Isaiah. He shot thirty six percent from three. I don't think he took a lot of threes, but he's a guy that I think is going to have a ten year NBA career. Daniel Otoru is someone that I know we were very interested in seeing when it came to the second round of our NBA mock draft, uh, seeing his potential there, like you said, uh, scored 20 points a game, almost 12 rebounds a game, if I remember correctly. And then he was a shot blocker as well. I think maybe, like you said, could be somebody that develops, if he develops an outside shot that could help keep him on the floor in an NBA game. So we'll have to see how his career pans out. So that leaves the top five. So who do you have at number five for the best centers headed towards the NBA draft? Zeke, Zeke Naji from Arizona. He uh, he shot up my, my board. He's another guy that I didn't think would be a, a one-and-done player. Very efficient from the field. I mean, he kind of tailed off a little bit, but at the start of the season, I want to say he was shooting like 80% from the floor through maybe his first three or four games. He finished at 57%. 
I think he has nice touch around the rim. Um, he's he has some skill, um, just not a good rebounder, and he he needs to put on weight. So I think his his um, a lot of his potential is just based off of how much weight and how much strength that he can put on his frame because he's he's about 240 pounds now, but he's smaller than that. But he's he's also young; he's only 19 years old. That's true, and that could be leaving a lot of time for his development out there because he's still, like you said, the 19, so has time to develop more in his game than maybe someone older. So who do you have at number four for this year's uh, edition of the eight centers that might be you know, going and heading towards the NBA draft? Number four is a guy that could easily be on the power forward list, but for me I think his long-term – Potential in his best position in the NBA is a five, and that's Jalen Smith out of Maryland. He's a guy that I thought could have possibly came out last year. He um, decided to come back. I don't think it really helped his stock or hurt it. I think he's pretty much at the same spot, but he's a pretty good athlete. He has some shooting potential also. But it just seems like there's something that he's missing. I can't really put my finger on what he's missing because he has the skill set and he has the tools, but um, just something that – some intangibles that I feel like he lacks at this point. So why has he still remained in your top five? Like I said, I know you just – because you said there's a lot of holes in his game, and it seems like they're maybe at number five, number six, number seven, maybe some that we've talked about that maybe – on the surface might appeal to the fans or the, the general eye more, but what do you see at number four that really sticks out as far as him being up that high on the list? I think he has better potential defensively than, than the guys that I listed. I listed ahead of him. I think he does have some ability to switch out on, on the wings and, you know, be able to stay in front of a few guys for until the help comes. So I would say the, his defensive potential is what kind of separates him from the guys that I have ahead of him. And that's something that people have to think about because the fact that there's often a lot of switching now going on in today's NBA. Uh, centers or big guys really have how to move their feet. There's been a lot of critics out there talking about players who don't move their hips very well. I know Obi Toppin. Uh, I know you, you and I talked about the way he's very upright and doesn't have the kind of mobility that you'd like to see. So that may hold him back from being one of those really top tier picks uh, is the fact that he doesn't move fluidly enough. And that's something these centers, these big have to understand or the people that play in the number five position, it's, they're going to be switched out on guards a lot. And in order to go ahead and defend them effectively, they're going to have to move their feet. They have to move their, their have that type of fluidity, move their hips to be able to go ahead and, and really defend the ball well to stay on the floor. So I, I really see he's higher up on your list than others because of the fact that defensively he can stand himself out, and that's what you're going to on the floor, sometimes even more from the number five spot than an offensive game. Uh, I now see why that could be the case. Yeah. Who do you and, have? Uh, I mean, go ahead. I was just going to say, to be honest with you, I, I think that with Obi Toppin, I think he ends up, um, and closing lineups, I think he ends up being a five. I see he may that start as well. At, at the four, but yeah, I just think he ends up, you know, when they want to put the best offensive lineup in towards the end of the games, I can see him being switched in and out, but I think he may have more of, a, of an advantage at the five. I think something that they're going to be leaning towards too. I picked him at number five in Detroit because I think they're going to lose Christian Wood in free agency. And because of that, they're going to need someone that's going to play that small ball set, like you said, starting the, the game out at power forward. And then maybe, like you said, when it comes down to the, the ultimate death lineup, so to speak, for lack of a better term, that whatever team has, that he's going to end up playing that small ball center. So we're going to see a lot of those fives taken off the court and – that we're even seeing now that you're even drafting now and to be able to move better on the defensive end. So who do you have at number three? We're now into the top three for the best centers in the NBA draft or headed to there anyways. Who do you have at number three for the top 10 centers in the NBA draft? Number three, I have Vernon Carey. 
from Duke. He had a very productive freshman season. Again, I mean, it sounds like I keep repeating myself, but he's a guy that in another era, he's a much higher pick. He could probably go late first round, but I wouldn't be shocked to see him go early second also. He's 265. He's definitely a pure center, which, you know, depending on who you ask, there's not a lot of them left in the league, but he does have some shooting potential. He shot well from three. He didn't take a lot of threes, but I'm looking at he shot 38% from three. He's an okay free throw shooter, but he does look like he has a, a nice touch. He's someone I would buy stock into his potential as a as a shooter down the line. So there you go, Vernon Carey from Duke at number three, a very solid outing, especially when you're considering he played for one of the most prestigious uh, teams in the NCAA. So big guys the past few years have, have really made a name for themselves, Zion Williamson. So we, while I'm not expecting anything of that high level, still this guy could make a definite contribution. And learning under Krzyzewski, you see the effect it has on these players a lot of these Duke stars, they seem to translate not too bad to the NBA. I mean, we see a lot of those Duke alumni that are picked have serviceable careers and actually very good careers. Yeah, I agree. And then even if he's borderline or he's if there's two players are the same player, and I think just because he has Duke behind his name, he'll get the nod. So he should have a long, productive NBA career. So we're down to the top two, my friend, down to the top two as far as the centers in the NBA draft. I have a feeling I know who you're going to pick at number one, or maybe I don't. So who do you have at number two for the top two centers in the NBA draft? Number two, I have Onyeka Okongu. He's he's probably the highest riser. If he's not, then I guess you can say his high school teammate, LaMelo Ball, is, but as far as just guys who, if you looked at draft boards from this time last year to where they're at now, you can, you can make a case and say he's the highest riser. He's I like him a lot. I don't think he'll fall below number eight. He should not fall. Well, I put it like this. He should not fall past Charlotte. <laughs> no matter where um, Charlotte picks, I think he's just an ideal fit based off of um, – the tankathon standings, and we don't know where the ping pong balls are going to fall at, but I think he's just an ideal fit for Charlotte. I mean, I've seen a lot of people make comments that he has, he may not have as high ceiling as James Wiseman, but he has a very high floor. And so you know what you're going to get out of him. Good rebounder. He's athletic, soft touch. I like his potential as a passer. Um, I don't know how many double teams he'll face, but if he, um, you know, if, if there's a situation that he's he's being doubled, I think he makes good reads. And I also think that he'll be better in the NBA than he was in college just because for whatever reasons, USC ran two bigs. They ran two post players. So there wasn't a lot of spacing. So I think um, once he gets in the NBA with floor spacing, I think that he'll be a good um, rim runner, I think a good role man, vertical lob threat. I mean, I really like him a lot. He has a high energy base. He really will mm-hmm. go ahead and, and work in the gym. And as I stated in the NBA mock draft, I think the effort is not in question. The fact that he won't try mm-hmm. and work hard to get better is not the question. Like you said, it's the ceiling of where he can go as a player and max himself out. I think he will max himself out as a player, if barring, barring injury, of course. I think it's the fact that the ceiling for him, like you said, is not as high as other players that are considered higher up in the NBA draft. He is a similar size to someone that there's already that is going to be finally off of his massively overpaid contract in Bismack Biombo. And with Biombo, it just seems like it, the, uh, a Kongu is a more talented version of that. Am I wrong in saying that? Or do you see something much more substantial than him? Because Biombo, at his height, could play a, a really heck of a lot of defense. And Okongwu, I think, is a much more talented individual than that, but still he has that same type of mentality on the defensive end and can give you that, but still give you some flash on the offensive end as well. Yeah, I mean, the biggest difference between the two is their hands. Biombo struggles catching passes and 
Um, he bobbles the ball, so he's not a guy that you trust on the offensive end, while Convo has great hands. So that's, to me, that's the biggest difference between the two. As far as, except, you know, Convo definitely has a higher ceiling. But, yeah, I mean, I, I really, really like him. I'm high on him. And I wouldn't even be mad if someone had him as their number one center over over James Wiseman, who <laughs> obviously is probably the last, the last one left, but who I would have as my number one guy. So that's exactly what I was going to lead into. That leaves James Wiseman, who some consider out there a number one pick, depending on the team that's drafting up there. And we've talked about this before, where you said you would not trade the number one pick if you were Golden State, and you had the number one pick, and you picked James Wiseman at the top of the draft. You know, seeing his potential, why do you think, since he is our number one choice at the top ten centers in draft, why do you think he's considered a number one pick? And then why do you also think that he could fall down very far as well? In fact, like you said, he could be even below Okongwu and a lot of other players that if he doesn't get picked number one. Well, talent-wise, there's, there's really not a question about his talent. He's athletic. He's bouncy. He's agile. He moves well. He has potential as a shooter. I think the questions behind his game are – he just never really dominated when he played against real competition. He has he had some really good – well, he had two really good games this year, but they were against, I think, Chicago State or South Carolina State. So they were small schools. He did okay against Oregon. But even if you watch him in, like, the McDonald's game or the Jordan brand or even, like, some of the other high-level games, you saw the talent. He just didn't dominate. He He didn't seem like he had the – this aggressive takeover mentality, but talent wise, I mean, he's very talented. And uh, I mean, I've seen some comparisons to Jermaine O'Neal. I've seen some comparisons to David Robinson as far as like, you know, build and athleticism and, and skill set. And I mean, I'm high on the skill set. And if I'm Golden State, I, w- I would take him simply because I just believe in their, I believe in. Having him in a team with strong veterans, I think they'll push him and they'll be able to maximize his potential. I think that's what it comes down to when it comes out to James Wiseman is that it's based off the team who drafts him as far as seeing his potential is concerned, that it comes down to the team that drafts him. You could see on a team, I don't want to say the Knicks, I don't want to say the Cavaliers, a team that's not exactly in a great frame and mindset right now, mm-hmm. they'll throw him out there. They'll have him learn the learn the road and learn the ropes and all that, but unfortunately, they'll also have him. They'll not give him the kind of the kind of teaching, the kind of instruction, the kind of things that you need for someone to re- fulfill their their full potential. And with James Wiseman, you think it's all about fit, and you think it's all about the team that drafts him being able to reach his potential. Yeah, I mean, I just think like if you're Golden State, you have the luxury of being able to gamble on. His talent. If you don't get the pick right, you're still fine short term. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think that he's a guy that if you put him in the wrong situation, the wrong team, he could be a productive guy on paper, but a low impact guy um, as far as the impact that he makes on, on the game. So well, it's 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 going to be very interesting to see where he goes and if he falls. I mean, like I said, I've seen him number one, but then I've seen some situations where he can fall out of the top five. I mean, the NBA scouts really get an opportunity to really watch him play. I mean, outside of the, the games that they were able to scout when he was in high school, he only played three games this season. I mean, do you question, you know, how bad did he want to play this season? I mean, some people may feel like he could have came back. I feel like he would have got suspended again if he if he would have paid the eleven thousand dollars or whatever. But it's just such a small sample size, so you really. And then with this whole situation with not being able to to do workouts, you're just really going to have to go based off of what you saw on high school. We'll be back with more of the Lakers Fast Break podcast. Needing an edge for your fantasy football team? Listen to the guys at Inside Sports Fantasy Football. 
for insight that will help you reach your league championship. That's Inside Sports Fantasy Football. Check it out today on your favorite podcast outlet. There you have it. It's the top 10 centers headed towards the NBA draft. If you have any questions for Raphael, you can go ahead on his Twitter, NBA Barlow with an E, B-A-R-L-O-W-E 500, at Barlow 500 on Twitter, or also as well, again, NBA Draft Junkies. That's at NBA Draft Junkies on Twitter. Or if you want to send us a question that I can read to them on the show, just hit me up at Lakers Fast Break or Lakers Fast Break at Yahoo.com. Just been a great time talking once again. Do you want to go point guards or shooting guards when we talk next week? Let's let's go twos, and then we'll finish with the ones. Okay, so next week it will be the shooting guards, the top ten shooting guards for the NBA draft, and then the time after that will be the top ten point guards for the NBA draft. Just a very interesting conversation. This conversation actually gets even more interesting when it concerns the guards because there are a lot of guards that are – now uh, going to be eligible for the NBA draft. And the point guard discussion is going to be there. And, and obviously what's going on with a lot of the different faces there, and that's more dynamic. And the shooting guards, basically, like you said before, they got to be able to play in today's NBA. So I want to hear definitely what you think, who will be the top 10 shooting guards headed for the NBA draft coming up. But before we head on out, we got to go ahead and talk to you about what's coming up with NBA Draft Junkies We've got all those great videos, your YouTube channel, NBA Draft Junkies, and of course, your great site, NBADraftJunkies.com. Yeah, not, not much has changed, to be honest with you. Just continue to try to put out content. Um, I dropped a video. By the time this episode comes out, I'll have um, a strengths and areas of improvement for Denny Avija. Both of those videos are out on YouTube. And then I, I would say by the time we speak, I have a Killian Hayes, two Killian Hayes videos up. So be on the lookout for those. Then you can go to the site, NBADraftJunkies.com. I have my my mock lotto based off of the Tankathon standings, and I'm in the process of working on my um, first round, just finishing the whole first round. Well, there you go. you got to check out his awesome experience known as NBA Draft Junkies, whether it's on his YouTube channel and like his videos and subscribe while you're there. And also his great site, NBADraftJunkies.com, your brother James Barlow. I'm sorry he couldn't make it on to uh, the second round of the mock draft, but I'm hoping he'll get on again when we revisit the mock draft when the lottery selections are announced whenever that hits. So I'm, I'm looking forward to speaking to him again, as I am yourself, coming up here next week. So I'm looking forward to it. And any last thoughts on the way out? No, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to come on your show again and talk basketball, something I really appreciate. And I'm looking forward to coming on again and we can figure out who are the best 10 shooting guards in the draft. I'm looking forward to it as well. You're always welcome here, and you've been a great part of it. I cannot thank you enough because your shows have been tremendous for us as far as listening and the people have enjoyed it, I'm sure because they keep coming back for more. All of our draft stuff has just been great and outstanding. I thought it thought it would be different. Somebody, I've got asked, why did I go off into the NBA draft and, and all the shows and, and reach out to all the experts and whatnot? Because it's been great, but it was interesting because a lot of these other Lakers shows, they're always dealing now in this time of pandemic with, with things going on in the past. And yeah, I touch on that with Laker Tom, and I may touch on that with my other uh, your regular host, TJ Johnson, that comes on. Uh, that once he's been able to catch up because he uh, congratulations he did have a, a baby uh, tj johnson jr which was born over the weekend but he's, he's coming back soon yeah, i like to go ahead and touch on the nba as a whole i know people have heard shows that i've done on the lakers fast break that have touched on not only the lakers but the entire nba and what's going on there and the future of the nba is just as important as what is going on in the past and I know a lot of these Lakers shows are delving into what was the best Lakers team, the you know, reliving the Lakers championship from X amount of year, and you decide and your thoughts on that and whatnot. And that's all great, and that's all well and good. But I like to go ahead and move forward and be current at what's going on. And the NBA draft, these kids are making big decisions. with their 18, 19, 20, uh, 21, and they're making the biggest decisions of their lives by heading into the NBA draft. And you know, a wrong decision could cost them. I'm sure you've seen it, Raphael, in your time working with these kids and 
working in the G League have cost them, in some occasions, millions of dollars. Yeah, that's very, very expensive mistake. <laughs> you know, it's a life changing mistake. Yes, it is life changing, and and you go from a player that was once heavily touted, but you make the wrong move, or you make the wrong decision, or you give with an agent too early, and you've seen the residual effects from that, I imagine. Yeah, and even in some cases, it's just choosing the wrong school. Um, you choose the wrong school where you there's some schools that you have a short window. If you don't show one and done potential, they already have their next five-star recruit coming in, and you're kind of pushed out because – you know, if you come back for your sophomore year, you may not start. There's somebody that may be better than you. So it's it's just one of those things where there's so much that can possibly go wrong and go right. It's just you, you have to, you know, find the right – you got to be in the right situation as far as right school, right representation, and even which we've touched on in, in this uh, podcast is right birth date, you know. <laughs> Exactly. And one of the things I want to ask you before we head on out is, do these kids have a lot of these people, and you've seen it over the course of years, these entourages, these people in their ear all the time telling them they're so great or hyping them up when you could tell them otherwise. Do you do you talk to any of these kids and tell them, this is where you rank on my list. It's nothing personal, but this is where you rank amongst all these NBA drafts. You may want to take a closer look at that before you commit to getting an agent, before you commit to uh, your life where it could be something that if you went back to school or vice versa, if you went into the NBA now, instead of staying at school, you know, this could be the best position for your life going forward. Yeah. I, but I think the conversation I've had the most is understanding role and fit. You know, like if you tell a kid today, Oh, I think you're the next PJ Tucker which PJ is going to have a long career. He's going to make a lot of money. But if that kid thinks that he's the next, I don't know, superstar, then sometimes that could be the reason why he makes it and why he doesn't. It's just because of not understanding the role or fit or where he stands. And especially because with social media now, you know, a kid can be famous before he even plays a college game. And so a lot of them have a hard time understanding that, there are only, you know, maybe 15 stars in the NBA. Everyone else is a complimentary player. So understanding who you are and, and where you're going to make the most money at in your career is the, the toughest conversation that I've had to have with a, with a couple guys. And it's not necessarily about going to school or staying. It's just understanding your role. And that's something hopefully that these young men will start getting uh, the understanding because, like you said, a lot of these kids have heard as they come up through the, the AEU ranks, the high school ranks, they hear how great they are. They see where they rank on the rivals. They see that they're ranked at such and such, and they see that they're number, what a, you know, number whatever on top 100, and they, they read a lot into that, but they don't fully understand that when it's time come to the NBA – that it may or may not be the best interest at this point in time for their careers because other people are seeing where they're developing are not, uh, you know, they don't have a financial interest interest per se directly. You don't have, when you talk to these kids, don't have a, a direct interest in that kid, whether he signs that deal or goes back to college. You're, when you're speaking to them, you're just thinking about their best options and where they stand in your eyes as an observer, as an impartial observer, where their future, if they commit to the NBA, goes from here. Yep. that's. Um, but the, the good thing is that in basketball, if you don't make it, there's still options to be successful and make a lot of money. Unlike football, if you don't make the NFL, you make the wrong choice. There's not many options to make money, especially for what you're going through and what you're putting your body through as a football player. So, that is the good thing about the NBA. If you make that mistake and you don't make it, you can go to Europe and have a long career. You can go to China. You can go to Australia. And um, and there's still a window to where if you don't make it when you're 19 or 20, you can come back later on and develop those skills and, and then end up making it again. So it's not always a mistake because at the end of the day, if you think about it, 
maybe 50% of the NBA players have played in the G League at one time or another. So you can always go there and develop and make up for if your draft stock was lower, you made a decision that wasn't the best for you earlier at, as a teenager, you can make up for it in the NBA. Well, I'll tell you what, your insight is most appreciated and most valuable. Hopefully these kids that you've talked to will make or have made the right decisions because of it in their lives. And uh, Raphael, I, I appreciate the insight that you give. I feel smarter about what's going on in the NBA draft every time I talk to you. And believe me, there was a lot of empty space there. So I appreciate everything that you give to us here. Thank you so much for bringing us that knowledge. And I'm continuing our conversations coming up next week when we talk about the top 10 shooting guards in the NBA and the top 10 point guards for the NBA draft as well. We have time. <laughs> that we do, that we do. Well, it was great talking to you, Raphael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies. Check out his awesome site, nbadraftjunkies.com. Well, Raphael Barlow, it's been great having you on the show. Looking forward to our next conversation coming up right here next week on the Lakers Fast Break Podcast.